During the summer of 2020, protesters in downtown Seattle overtook Interstate 5, resulting in the freeway's closure. Tragedy struck on the 19th night of demonstrations when a driver who knew that the road was closed drove onto it anyway in search of a shortcut. 30-year-old DeWitt Kalete drove the wrong way, using an off-ramp to board the highway, drove around a barrier and plowed into the crowd of protesters. The car struck 24-year-old Sumner Taylor, who was sent flying through the air and died, and 32-year-old Diaz Love, who spent several weeks in the hospital with serious injuries. A witness chased down Kalete's car and forced him to stop by pulling in front of the vehicle. Kalete passed a sobriety test and did not appear to have acted with intent, but investigators concluded that he had still broken the law. He initially pleaded not guilty to vehicular homicide, vehicular assault and reckless driving, but eventually took responsibility for his actions and pleaded guilty as charged. The judge sentenced him to 78 months in prison, noting that while there was no evidence of Kalete's actions being deliberate or politically motivated, his conduct was extremely reckless. Kalete declined to speak at his sentence in hearing, but his defense attorney stated that the convicted killer had a robust acknowledgement of his culpability. Number 11. Kimberly Falkenstein As the coronavirus pandemic took the planet by storm in 2020, many Americans pushed back against newly imposed safety measures including mask mandates, social distancing guidelines and stay-at-home orders. One such individual was 33-year-old former police officer Kimberly Falkenstein who spent a Sunday afternoon in May protesting beach closures in Miami. Falkenstein was demonstrating with like-minded people in Loomis Park when she decided to take things a step further by leaving a designated protest and walking onto a closed beach with a sign that said, We are free! A man named Chris Nelson, who's believed to be her husband, filmed Falkenstein as she trekked onto the sand, describing her as a brave lady who's ready to make a statement. The trio of police officers who confronted her were far less impressed by the stunt, and they became even more unamused when Falkenstein refused to leave the beach and return to the protest area instead of complying with the order. Falkenstein said she had a right to be on the beach because it was a public place. The officers warned her that they would arrest her if she continued refusing to leave and she informed them that she was aware of the consequences, so they arrested her. Falkenstein remained uncooperative, forcing the officers to carry her to a police car. She posted a $2,500 bond and was released after being booked into custody on charges of resisting an officer without violence, trespassing and violating an emergency order. Records show that she squared the case away about a month later with no major consequences, and it appears as though she's avoided any further legal trouble since then. Number 10. Daniel Perry While working as an Uber driver in July of 2020, 33-year-old former U.S. Army Sergeant Daniel Perry drove onto a crowded street during a Black Lives Matter protest in Austin, Texas. He had initially stopped and honked his horn at the demonstrators who were blocking the road before running a red light and driving straight toward the gathering. 28-year-old Air Force veteran Garrett Foster approached Perry's vehicle in an apparent attempt to stop him from driving any further into the crowd. Perry fatally shot Foster and fled the scene, but was soon identified as the suspect and questioned by the police. He claimed that he had acted in self-defense against Foster, who was legally carrying an AK-47 during the confrontation, but his version of events conflicted with eyewitness accounts of what had happened. Perry claimed that Foster had raised his gun at him, but people who were present at the scene of the shooting said that this was not the case. He was charged with murder but maintained his innocence and fought the case, claiming he had acted within his rights under the state's Stand Your Ground law. During the trial, the prosecution presented a plethora of social media posts which clearly stated Perry's ill feelings toward protesters. He was especially critical of the Black Lives Matter movement, comparing the protest to a zoo full of monkeys and accusing the movement of being racist against white people. On several occasions, Perry made comments about how he was prepared to defend himself. To some, it seemed like he enjoyed the idea of hurting someone 
involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, causing some to speculate that he was looking to instigate a conflict on the day of the shooting. During a search of Perry's phone, investigators found a voicemail from his mother urging him to stop posting bad things on Facebook because it's really hurting people's feelings and it's wrong. But he didn't take the advice and in 2023, a jury found him guilty of murder, resulting in a 25-year prison sentence. In a shocking twist, Texas Governor Greg Abbott pardoned Perry in May of 2024. He walked free from prison and while he still faces a misdemeanor charge for deadly conduct in connection with the shooting, he's already served more than the maximum punishment that the crime carries. In other words, it's highly unlikely that he'll get any more prison time, even if he's found guilty. Number 9. Amina T. Musa McCaskill and Tressa I. Johnson Immediately after the 2020 US presidential election, protests broke out in Minnesota and elsewhere throughout the country. In Minneapolis, two young women were arrested for crimes against police officers during a demonstration along Interstate 94. 19-year-old Amina T. Musa McCaskill was accused of shining a laser directly into a cop's eyes, which can cause significant damage to a person's vision. Thankfully, the officer was wearing special safety glasses which protected his eyes. McCaskill was charged with felony second-degree riot but seems to have avoided any major trouble with the law since then. The next day, 29-year-old Tressa I. Johnson was arrested for disobeying an officer's orders and kicking him when he tried to escort her. She was charged with fourth-degree assault and obstructing the legal process. McCaskill and Johnson were among nearly 650 people who were cited during the protest along the interstate. While most of the demonstrators were charged with low-level offenses, many of them had to endure the inconvenience of sitting around for hours among hundreds of other detainees and waiting to be processed. In a tweet following the arrests, the Minnesota State Patrol reminded the public that it supports their First Amendment right to free speech, but the freeway is not a place to do that. Number 8. Fed Up Motorists vs Climate Protesters In September of 2023, climate protesters from a group called Last Generation blocked traffic in a busy highway in Mannheim, sparking the ire of stranded drivers. Several motorists exited their cars and confronted the demonstrators, who sat on the pavement refusing to move. One very infuriated 29-year-old man physically attacked the activists with an onslaught of punches and kicks. He then dragged them off the road one by one and continued his drive. Police brought him in for questioning the next day and he was charged with assault. Just days before the attack, a Mannheim police officer poured oil on the head of a protester who was blocking traffic on a bridge. A group of demonstrators had glued their hands to the structure and police were using the oil to separate their hands from the pavement. Cell phone footage appeared to corroborate the eco-activist claims that officers had deliberately doused them with the oil. About a month earlier, a driver in Munich drove into a group of protesters who were blocking a road dragging several demonstrators hundreds of feet along the pavement. On numerous occasions, irritated civilians forcefully dragged activists to the side of the road. These incidents came amid a noticeable uptick in climate protests along Germany's major roads and bridges, leaving many motorists feeling pushed to their limit. But the activists have made it clear they have no plans to stop demonstrating in a way that they believe conveys the urgent need to combat climate change. Number 7. Lancaster Riots In September of 2020, protests over an officer-involved shooting in Lancaster, Pennsylvania escalated into riots. Demonstrators gathered outside the Lancaster City Bureau of Police and remained put even after they were warned to leave or chemicals would be dispersed into the air for the sake of crowd control. The protesters chose to stay and when the police began deploying chemical munitions, they threw them back at law enforcement. They also hurled bottles, rocks, bricks and other items at the cops and lit things on fire, smashed glass and damaged police vehicles. 
12 people were arrested, including 34-year-old Jessica M. Lopez, who was later convicted of riot, criminal conspiracy, failure to disperse, obstruction of highways, disorderly conduct and defiant trespass. She was sentenced to 13 to 30 months in prison. In November of 2022, a jury found 31-year-old Lee Wise and 23-year-old Taylor Enterline guilty of riot, failure to disperse, obstructing highways and defiant trespass. They were both sentenced to probation. The remaining nine defendants all pleaded guilty to an array of different charges and received sentences ranging from a $300 fine to more than four years in prison. Number 6. Jennifer Watson In May of 2020, a Colorado teenager named Jennifer Watson drove into a crowd of protesters during a Justice for George Floyd demonstration outside the state capital in Denver. Cell phone footage showed 22-year-old Max Bailey blocking Watson's SUV while another demonstrator jumped on the hood for a few seconds. The young woman fled the scene and was captured at a later time. Watson stepped on the gas, striking Bailey and briefly dragging him along the road. Thankfully, he wasn't seriously injured. Bailey told CBS Colorado that he was trying to stop Watson from driving through the crowd because his sister was at the protest and he was worried about her safety. Following her arrest, Watson claimed she was afraid for her safety when she struck Bailey, but some witnesses said that it seemed like she had hit the young man on purpose. Despite this apparent possibility, Bailey harbored no ill will toward Watson, saying, I hope you have peace in your heart and you'll understand what you did. In July of 2021, a jury found Watson guilty of reckless driving and acquitted her of assault. The judge sentenced her to 48 hours of community service. Number 5. Elijah Gant In August of 2024, protesters gathered in Ferguson, Missouri, to mark the 10th year anniversary of the death of Michael Brown, a black teenager who was shot to death by a police officer named Darren Wilson. Brown's death had ignited civil unrest in cities across the US, and the decision not to indict Wilson only perpetuated the public's anger over police brutality and racial injustice. Police intervened in the 2024 protest when they noticed demonstrators trying to pull down a perimeter fence outside the police station. Officer Travis Brown ran after one of the suspects, 28-year-old Elijah Gant, who attempted to hide behind a minivan. As Brown positioned himself near the vehicle in preparation to apprehend the fleeing man, Gant suddenly charged at him, knocking him backwards onto the ground. Brown hit the back of his head against the pavement and suffered a critical brain injury. His fellow officers immediately rushed over to help him and arrest Gant, who resisted arrest and kicked an officer in the head during a struggle with the cops. Gant is facing charges of property damage, resisting arrest, and two counts of assault of a special victim. He remains held in lieu of a $500,000 cash-only bond and could face between 10 and 30 years in prison if convicted as charged. He's retained one of the area's best criminal defense attorneys, Scott Rosenblum. In the meantime, Officer Brown remains in the intensive care unit with an unclear prognosis. Number 4. Brandon McCormick Just days after the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020, 58-year-old Brandon McCormick drove to the scene of a protest in downtown Salt Lake City, Utah where hundreds of demonstrators had gathered. During an argument with protesters, he retrieved a bow from his car and pointed it at the crowd. Witnesses would later claim that McCormick threatened to shoot them with arrows and waved a knife in the air while hurling racial slurs at bystanders. Onlookers disarmed McCormick, who looked beaten and bloody by the time police pulled him from the scene. Cell phone footage captured by witnesses appeared to show protesters beating him with their fists and hitting him with skateboards. Right as McCormick was being rescued by the police, protesters overturned his car and set it on fire. Detectives retrieved the bow from inside the charred remains of his car and McCormick was charged with multiple crimes for threatening people with his bow. Later that year, McCormick pleaded guilty to felony possession of a dangerous weapon by a restricted person and felony aggravated assault. During his sentencing hearing, 
He claimed he didn't remember pointing the bow at anyone and denied knowing that it was illegal for him to have it in public. He admitted to making racist remarks, telling the court that he became racist while serving prison time in California, but claimed that he was turning over a new leaf while addressing his alcoholism and anger problems. As it turned out, this wasn't the only time McCormick was accused of going on a racist rampage in public. According to prosecutors, he was heard shouting racial epithets at the scene of a road rage incident in Taylorsville, although it's unclear whether he ever faced any charges in connection with the matter. McCormick was sentenced to a year in county jail followed by probation and was fined $5,000. The judge also imposed a five-year suspended prison sentence, which would go into effect if he violated his probation. Number 3. Christy Bennett As a Black Lives Matter protest in Bloomington, Indiana, drew to a close one evening in July of 2020, a driver turned onto a crowded street and became irate. As a crowd purposely blocked traffic, a passenger exited the vehicle and threw a scooter belonging to one of the demonstrators then got back into the car. As a woman ran up to the car to confront the people inside, the driver stepped on the gas and struck two people. 35-year-old Jeff Stewart was briefly dragged by the vehicle while 29-year-old Chastity Mottinger landed on the car's hood. The victims fell off the vehicle as it turned a corner, knocking Mottinger unconscious. She was treated for a concussion and a laceration to the head while Stewart sustained abrasions to his arms. Stewart later told the Indianapolis Star that the driver accelerated into the crowd when people asked her to roll down the window of her car and confronted her about where she was going. He overheard someone telling the impatient motorist that if she waited a minute for the crowd to clear, she would be able to drive down the street. Several people chased after the car as it sped away from the scene prompting police to advise the public to be on the lookout for a red Toyota Corolla, matching the description given by the witnesses. Multiple witnesses turned over footage containing the car's license plate number, and law enforcement arrested the hit-and-run driver, 66-year-old Christy Bennett, at a motel two days after the incident. They also arrested her passenger, who was released without charges after being questioned. Bennett refused to speak with investigators and was booked into custody on two counts of criminal recklessness and two counts of leaving the scene of an accident. She was released from jail after posting a $500 bond, leaving the victims and social justice activists feeling frustrated by what already seemed like a slap on the wrist. In an unexpected twist, the charges against Bennett were dropped in July of 2021 because she passed away. She was found dead in a Denver, Colorado hotel room with blunt force injuries to the head. While no definitive cause of death could be established, the medical examiner who performed her autopsy ruled out foul play and concluded that high blood pressure and other cardiovascular problems contributed to her demise. Today's topic was requested by Red Eye of Horus and Cowboy Bebop 44434. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Kevin Rivera A frustrated New Yorker reached his breaking point with anti-Israel protesters in January of 2024 when he exited his car and physically confronted a group of people who were blocking the entrance to the Manhattan Bridge, later identified as Kevin Rivera. The driver could be heard shouting, You're disrupting traffic, idiots! And you can't do that! That's against the law! Before exiting his SUV and approaching the demonstrators on foot, Rivera said he was about to start throwing fists and shoving protesters. Having gotten his point across, he then got back in his vehicle and slowly made his way through the crowd. At the time, Rivera had just finished working the graveyard shift and was on his way home to Brooklyn, where he lives with his young daughter. He later told the New York Post that he regretted his display of anger, especially since the incident was captured on video, and he was struggling to cope with all the attention the footage was getting. But he stood by his right to feel frustrated about the protests and said he was grateful for the outpouring of support he received from sympathetic strangers. 
Around 300 protesters were arrested at Manhattan's major bridges and tunnels that day amid their attempts to block the traffic during the morning rush hour. If these protesters couldn't get annoying enough, wait till you see what we've got lined up for you after number one. Our previous release of When Cry Babies Go Wrong is coming up next for those of you who haven't seen it yet, so stay tuned. Number one, Kenneth Darlington. In November 2023, a retired American lawyer and university professor fatally shot two climate protesters along a highway in Panama. 77-year-old Kenneth Darlington became frustrated with the group of demonstrators for overtaking the highway and causing a traffic jam in Chame, roughly 55 miles outside Panama City, for several weeks. Activists throughout the country had demonstrated against the government's recent deal to reopen a copper mine, leading them to block highways in an attempt to force attention to their cause. Footage of the demonstration showed Darlington approaching the protesters, who were lined up across the highway. According to witnesses, he could be heard saying something to the effect of, this ends here, before exiting his vehicle. Speaking from behind a blockade, he asked to speak with the leaders of the protest, while warning that he wanted to speak specifically with men, not women. During the altercation, he tore away the blockade and pulled a gun. The protesters could be heard shouting at Darlington, with one person saying, why don't you shoot? At the same time, several men approached him and tried to calm him down. He opened fire, shooting teachers Abdil Diaz and Ivan Mendoza. Diaz died at the scene and Mendoza was rushed to the hospital, where he was declared dead on arrival. Darlington fled in his vehicle and was apprehended during a traffic stop a short while later. He had previously been arrested in 2005 on an illegal gun charge after police found an AK-47 and an M-16 in his apartment, but managed to defeat the case by arguing in court that the guns were part of a collection. Because of his age, there was speculation that even if he was found guilty, he would be sentenced to house arrest in lieu of prison time. But that was not the case. In 2024, Darlington was found guilty of murdering Diaz and Mendoza and sentenced to 48 years in prison. In July of 2018, teenagers Jacob Muson and Drake Campbell cried in court as they appeared before a judge in Berkeley County, South Carolina to face charges of murder, attempted murder, burglary and armed robbery. They'd been involved in a deadly home invasion in Low Country in 2016 along with Campbell's older brother, 25-year-old Kenneth. The trio had ambushed 27-year-old Kadeem Johnson and his girlfriend at gunpoint in their home. After forcing the couple into the house, the Campbell brothers and Muzon robbed them of $3,000. They tied Johnson's hands with heavy-duty tape, pushed him to his knees and executed him. They also shot his girlfriend before fleeing the scene by stealing two vehicles from the property. The woman survived and was found with gunshot wounds to her hands and chest by first responders. Kenneth, who'd previously been convicted of voluntary manslaughter in 2015, was sentenced to life in prison. During their trial, Drake and Muzon struggled to hold back tears as they received their verdicts. Muzon was sentenced to 40 years in prison after being found guilty of murder, attempted murder and kidnapping. Drake was found guilty of armed robbery, kidnapping and possession of a weapon during a violent crime and received a 20-year sentence. Number 8. Anthony Roldan in the summer of 2021, teenager Anthony Roldan was taken into custody by the Chicago police following a fatal altercation that had occurred in the spring of that same year. The 18-year-old sobbed while having his mug shot taken after being charged with two felony counts of first-degree murder. According to police reports, Roldan had fatally shot a man and a woman in Humboldt Park on May the 21st of 2021. The teenager was with 20-year-old Justice Pierce in a line at a liquor store when they allegedly engaged in an argument with 18-year-old Adrian Navarro and Destiny Nunez, aged 23. As tensions escalated, Pierce threw a bottle at Navarro and started punching him repeatedly. Roldan reportedly threatened to smoke him and Nunez, who'd reportedly intervened to break up the fight. 
Roldan then brandished a pistol and started firing. Nunez and Navarro fled, but the gunmen went outside and fired more shots at them as they ran, striking each of them in the torso. The victims were taken to Norwegian hospital where they succumbed to their injuries. The incident was captured on surveillance cameras and the police tracked the men down via pod cameras and license plate readers. Both men were in the vehicle when it was stopped by law enforcement in early July of 2021. Officers recognized them from previous encounters and the surveillance footage of the fatal May altercation. Both were taken into custody and Roldan was charged with murder while Pierce was charged with aggravated battery. Number 7. Catherine Dennis Model and TV star Catherine Dennis was 20 years old when she was arrested and taken to South Carolina's Berkeley County Jail in 2012. Officers charged her with underage drinking and disorderly conduct. Dennis appeared to have been crying in her mugshot as her makeup was smudged around her eyes and down her cheeks. Only two years later, news of her dating millionaire politician Thomas Ravenel aged 51, started circulating in the media. The couple became stars of the Southern Charm reality series and caught the attention of tabloids, with publications subsequently reporting about their matching mugshots. Ravenel, the former treasurer for South Carolina, had had his processing photo taken in 2007 after being arrested on a federal cocaine charge. He ultimately pleaded guilty and received a sentence of 10 months behind bars. Number 6. Jacob Garrett On the night of January the 14th of 2018, Jacob Garrett was driving on Riverbank Road in Burlington, New Jersey with his 23-year-old girlfriend Stephanie White as a passenger. Garrett was reportedly speeding when he struck a parked minivan, causing his car to tumble over a wall and fall into the cold waters of the Delaware River. 24-year-old Garrett managed to get out as the vehicle broke through the ice and started sinking. He asked passers-by to help his girlfriend before fleeing the scene. The emergency services were called and found White in the car with her seatbelt still fastened. The woman was removed from the vehicle and was taken to a local hospital where she was pronounced dead. Garrett was tracked down with the help of a police canine unit and taken into custody on charges of leaving the scene of a fatal accident causing death while driving with a suspended license and endangering an injured victim. During his detention hearing on January the 23rd, the man broke down in tears while he was being questioned. He had only been in the courtroom for a few minutes when he stood up and asked to be taken out. The judge allowed it and ordered for him to be held in jail pending trial. In October of 2018, Garrett received a 15-year sentence behind bars after pleading guilty to vehicular homicide and leaving the scene of an accident. Number 5. Diana Lovejoy In September of 2016, Diana Lovejoy was in the middle of a court case with Greg Mulvihill related to their divorce and the custody of their son. The legal battle between the pair who were based in Carlsbad, California, had turned bitter as they'd failed to reach an agreement. On the night of September the 1st, Mulvihill got a call from a man claiming to be a private investigator. The caller told him that he was in possession of documents that could aid him in his divorce and custody hearing and offered Mulvihill a chance to see them. The alleged investigator instructed him to come to a dirt trail on Avenida Soledad, telling him that he would leave the documents at a power pole. Before going to the indicated rendezvous spot, Mulvihill spoke to the Carlsbad Police Department to check with authorities whether or not he should be concerned about the call. The dispatcher didn't express worry and the man decided to follow the purported private investigator's instructions. He asked his friend, Jason Kovach, to join him and they brought a baseball bat and a flashlight with them. When they arrived at the trail, Mulvihill and Kovach heard rustling in some bushes and spotted a man hiding in them wearing camouflage clothing. As soon as they realized he was pointing a rifle at them, the duo started running. The man shot his rifle and hit Mulverhill once under the armpit. He survived the attempt on his life and made a full recovery after the bullet had narrowly missed his heart. During the investigations that followed, it was discovered the shooter was Weldon McDavid Jr., a former Marine who was also Lovejoy's firearms instructor. Surveillance footage showed that the phone which had been used to call Mulverhill had been purchased from a Best Buy by Lovejoy herself. She and McDavid were convicted separately in November of 2017 of conspiracy to commit murder and attempted murder. Lovejoy cried during the trial and upon hearing her guilty verdict, she passed out in the courtroom. 
Her distraught family asked for someone to help her, and a news reporter attended to the woman before she was wheeled out on a gurney by paramedics. Lovejoy received a sentence of 25 years to life in prison, and McDavid was sentenced to 50 years to life, in addition to being ordered to pay Mulver Hill $500,000 in damages. Number 4. Jennifer Mee Jennifer Mee gained media attention in 2007 when she earned the nickname Hiccup Girl for appearing multiple times on NBC's Today Show to talk about not being able to find a cure for her long-lasting hiccups. Mee would once again appear in the news a few years later in circumstances that were monumentally different from her previous media darling persona. The 19-year-old met Shannon Griffin, aged 22, on a social networking website in October of 2010. Within a few days, the teenager asked him to meet her at a vacant house in St. Petersburg, Florida. When Griffin arrived at the rendezvous spot, Mee lured him to the back of the house where her friends, Laren Rayford and Lamont Newton, were armed and waiting for him. Rayford and Newton then robbed Griffin of less than $50, and when he tried to resist, they shot him four times with a 38 caliber revolver. Griffin died at the scene, and all three suspects were arrested and charged with first-degree murder hours after his body was discovered. Investigators established that Mee, Rayford, and Newton were living together at the time of the fatal robbery, and evidence indicated that Mee had orchestrated it. In a jailhouse phone call with her mother, she claimed, I didn't kill nobody, I set everything up. It all went wrong. The police weren't able to establish which of the suspects had been the gunman, and both Rayford and Newton were sentenced to life in prison without parole. During her trial in September of 2013, Me held her head in her hands and sobbed as she was read her verdict, receiving the same sentence as her accomplices. The woman continued crying as she was led out of the courtroom and taken to her jail cell. Number 3. Anthony Zingale on May the 28th of 2016, Anthony Zingel and his mother attended a house party in Plymouth, Wisconsin. At around 10.30 p.m., the host's wife was heard screaming for help from a bathroom inside the house. When several partygoers went to check on her, the woman claimed 19-year-old Zingel had walked into the restroom she was using while holding a knife. The teenager allegedly exposed himself from the waist down, pressed the knife to her throat and threatened to cut her if she didn't have relations with him. Police were called and a woman told officers that she was able to escape after persuading Zingel to leave the bathroom by saying they needed to go to a bedroom if he wanted to have intercourse. When the authorities arrived at the scene, the teenager immediately put his hands behind his back to be arrested. His version of events differed from the woman's, with Zingale telling officers that he needed to use the bathroom urgently and rushed to pull his pants down without realizing someone was inside the restroom. The 19-year-old admitted he had brought a knife with him and claimed the woman reached for it when he exposed himself. After Zingale was taken into custody, he was shown crying intensely in his mugshot. The photo went viral and the team was widely ridiculed by internet users. He was charged with first-degree assault of an intimate nature and carrying a concealed weapon facing up to 40 years in prison. Number 2. Victoria Thomas Freybutt on the night of September the 10th of 2019, a 911 operator in Newport, North Carolina, received a call from 56-year-old Victoria Thomas Frabert, who asked for help for her husband, 61-year-old James. The woman admitted to the dispatcher that she'd cut his favorite part of himself with a rose pruner. It would later emerge that she'd castrated her partner and seemed to be unbothered by the gravity of her actions during the emergency call. Victoria explained that the man was just dandy and complained about not having enough of his blood to make the sign of the cross or write sinner. Paramedics were sent to the scene and a woman was arrested on charges of malicious castration and kidnapping as she'd tied up her husband before mutilating him. The severed body part was located and put on ice, but updates didn't indicate if it was successfully reattached. Victoria didn't reveal a motive for cutting off her husband's manhood, but she talked about using him to send a message against sinning and referred to him as her soon-to-be ex during the call. She broke into tears during her first court appearance when a judge raised her bond from $100,000 to $500,000. Number 1. Alexander Downing Following his arrest on May the 3rd of 2017, Alexander Downing wept 
as he had his mugshot taken at a police station in South Padre Island, Texas. Earlier in the day, the 35-year-old man had been recorded launching an unprovoked 20-minute racist tirade against the Muslim family who were playing on a beach. One of the targets of his abusive rant, 19-year-old Noriah Alwood, filmed the whole incident with her cell phone and later uploaded the video to YouTube. The footage showed Downing screaming, cursing and grabbing his private parts in view of other beachgoers. As his aggression ramped up, the man slammed a chair on the beach, squared up and yelled slurs at Allwood's family members while mentioning Donald Trump's name and saying that he wasn't afraid of extremist groups. Other beachgoers intervened on behalf of the Allwood family, including one man who got between them and down in. The latter also said that his country is the greatest country in the world and screamed, you will never, ever, ever, ever stop me. Downing was charged with public intoxication following the incident and records showed he'd been arrested several times since 2003, including being charged in Florida for abuse of an elderly or disabled person and domestic violence battery. Thanks for watching. Hypothetically, if you had to choose between the speed limit in your country getting removed entirely and everywhere, or for the current speed limits to get slashed by 25%. Which option would you choose and why? Let us know in the comments section below.